G'day everyone, it's James Davis from the Paxade Academy again, and this time we've got Catherine from Project Draw. How are you doing, Catherine? Hi, really well. Very excited to be here. Well, so, thank you for joining me. One of my usual things to ask before we dive in is where in this wide world are you located? I am in Sydney, on the northern beaches in Sydney, actually. So it must be fairly nice at this time of year. Yeah, although today it's really wet and it's like clammy, humid kind of feeling. But that's, you know, we can get past that. That's right. That's why I live in Tassie to avoid all this. Yeah, oh. got it, the humidity. <laughs> well, got it. I'm excited to have you on board because interesting topic. We're, we'll be talking a lot about developing our team and developing their, their soft skills. Um, and I thought I'd just ask you a, a question to get us started around are people really happy with their jobs and are they all going to stay forever? Yeah, it's funny, right? Because um, a recent study from LinkedIn said that 59% of people are actually thinking about leaving their organisation in the next 12 months. Um, And interestingly, Immersa did a study also that they said that 78% of people would actually have stayed in the organisation had they known their career path. So career path and uh, upskilling uh, is really important into that retention piece, right? So actually keeping those people, yeah. And exploring the career path side, because that's really telling stats. That's, that's a lot of the workforce. What, 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 what really is a career path? I think a lot of people have different views on it, but what, what would you see it as? Yeah, I think the biggest misconception about career path is that it's up. Right, and we think, oh, we need to keep promoting people. And actually, I think of like career more like a rock climbing um, sort of platform. So sometimes you go back to go forward, sometimes you go sideways. Like there's lots of different places you can actually go, and that's career path. Sometimes career path is actually just expanding or enriching your existing role, or maybe even just staying in that role, but just getting you know different skills and and getting different responsibilities. So it, it's different for everybody but I think the misconception is that it's always up and so we have to oh I can't promote those people any further well actually that's not necessarily the, the right career path for them anyway yeah so it's, it's really interesting because I, I guess everyone's drummed into them and it's a, la- it's a ladder it's not the climb rock wall like you're, you're describing but in practice that's what I've always seen for most people is they do want those ways to move sideways or add extra Mm. responsibility. How do you know what someone should be doing? Well, I think that's having the conversation, right? It's actually asking people because and what's going to be right for somebody is going to be really different for other people. So one of the things that I really talk a lot about is career conversations, like in actually having those career conversations and having them, you know, on a regular, maybe even quarterly basis so that you can really understand where people are at and what is important to them because sometimes even they don't realise what is available to them. And sometimes it could be, you know, developing their career could be learning a new skill or, you know, having a stretch project, um, you know, growing networks, getting a mentor, you know, internal mobility, doing little projects and things. Like there's a whole range of different things that that could be. Um, and that's why having those conversations is so important. Well, how do you how do you have those sort of conversations? Is it as easy as just asking or is like what you said, a lot of people don't know what they don't know? I think... I think it is about asking, but I think it's it's being a little bit smarter than that. Like you need, if you're going to have a proper career conversation, it's going to be having a, a set time when you're both mentally ready for that. You know, so um, if I've got to go and pick up my kids after school, like, and so you set this meeting for four o'clock and I'm like, oh, I've got to get out of here by five. And so mentally I'm not going to be as ready, just like if, if you're not a morning person, you don't set it for first thing in the morning. Um, so I think you have to be mentally ready ready but I think also um, then it's about making sure that you're not being interrupted like you're not going to get interrupted and I think then it's then saying okay I want you to think about what it is that might be next for you and let's look at how we can kind of get you to that point or let's then ask I've got key questions that I might ask to see actually it might be something different to what you thought yeah. And I think, especially for the SMB space, a lot of people are afraid of having these conversations because they're afraid of people leaving. Is that is that oh. the reality of it? 
I've got my handy little quote that I keep really close to me. So it's the only thing this, – sorry, this is from Henry Ford. So, it's you know, it's quite old, but it says, the only thing worse than training your employees and having them lead is not training them and having them stay. I just think that's just so important, right? It, it is, and I, I think I've seen it a lot enough as well that if you're having these conversations, people don't actually want to leave. No, they don't. You're right. Yeah. And say we have this sort of conversation, uh, career path conversation, what should happen after it? So the key to good career conversations is you have the conversation and then you set up your next conversation and like whether that's going to be every month because some people will want it a little bit, they're more detailed and they want it to be more granular. But I reckon the ideal time is about quarterly and you have that and you set it for the next one and so you have your conversation and it, career progression is actually up to the employee so it's up to them to put those things into action um but it's up to us as leaders to ensure that they're on track and that they're following the plan as intended right so yeah. it's that accountability piece and having someone to brainstorm off is not well i think you've just frozen i missed that oh uh, it's the for me it's the um the accountability piece and the being able to brainstorm um, is what helps the employee get unstuck a lot of the times with those. So I missed some of that because we froze. So what? Sorry, can do you mind just repeating it? Um, so with this, what I'm picking up is the the person, you know, the owner or manager is really there to have hold them accountable and provide them with someone to brainstorm off so they can gain clarity for themselves to drive themselves. Yeah. And it's about just asking questions, right? Because um, if I'm having, if I'm the leader and having a conversation with you, you may not actually know what your next step is going to be, and that's okay. But you know, being able to ask you the right questions to sort of uncover, um, it doesn't have to be such a huge conversation that you're like, this is so moment, this is such a momentous conversation and time right now. It can be just chunking it down, right? And that, yeah. So it's just about asking the right questions. And that, that sort of chunking it down, I think most people, and correct me if I'm wrong, most people will end up trying to turn that into that traditional career conversation of what the promotion is and what technical what technical skills you've got and what you need. Yep. Is that the right way of, of looking at that development? It's because development is not just technical skills. And actually I reckon at the moment because, you know, when you look at the market and the innovation and disruption that's happening, I mean techni- technology is really driving innovation, right? You know, you think about AI and autonomous driving, you know, all of those things, it, it's sort of it's the market is moving so quickly. So technically we can't always keep up, but it's having the, being able to coach people and having those soft skills is that's where it's really important for that. Yeah. And what sort of, let's dive into the soft skills. What sort of yeah. soft skills are we, are we generally talking about? Look, it can be a range of different stuff depending, but, you know, in terms of um, what I spend a lot of time being asked for and talking about would be elevator pitches. So how do you how do you introduce yourself in a compelling way and the organisation in a compelling way? And that's not just for salespeople, right, because you could be talking to vendors or whoever, clients, customers, um, even internally, just to be able to say, well, this is what I do and what I bring. So elevator pitch is a really important thing. Um, pres- presentation skills is another one and being able to package up information in a compelling way so that people, you know, you get buy-in. Um, networking, that's another one that I get asked to talk about a lot. So networking is absolutely critical. Um, those are the top three for me that I get asked a lot, yeah. And, and I think for a lot of people hearing it, they can sort of get, they can sort of see and feel, yeah, that could be useful. But I think a lot of, especially small businesses, will go, uh, it's not really core to their job. Why would I want to do those kind of those top three um, skills as an example? Yeah, so it's it's funny, right? Because the, I reckon the world goes round through networks, right? It's who you know, and and that that helps 
as a small business owner, that certainly helps me because my employees also know people, right? Um, but in terms of elevator pitches, then that is about being able to articulate who you are, particularly in a networking situation. It can be a perfect example. So being able to uh, say that um, and introduce yourself and the organisation in a compelling way actually puts people on the front foot. In a, a, a different like space that I work in is in interviewing and I'll interview, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll help candidates to learn to interview. Um, but there's a really um, interesting um, study that was done and it's really hard to pinpoint when this was, but say 2016 um, and LinkedIn promote it or, or talk about it a lot. And they interviewed 2,000 hiring managers and a third of those hiring managers had made a hiring decision in the first 90 seconds of meeting somebody, okay? And let me tell you, with a, as a recruitment background, it is almost impossible to change a hiring manager's mind once they've made it, right? So a third of them have made a yes or no on that candidate in the first 90 seconds. So why is that relevant here? Well, you think about that translates when you're meeting people like out networking or whatever, right? Meeting new clients, doing a pitch, whatever. A third of those people are likely to make a decision in the first 90 seconds based on your introduction. So that's why those things are really important. And, and especially for such a customer service focused industry that we are, the, the team the help desk is always doing it all day, every day. The project team, the sales team, the, even our internal operations are needing to convey complex information in, in a short amount of time in a very considered way that to non-technical people. So the, that whole, in, you know, being able to introduce yourself and convey that knowledge in, in that sort, it's a very important skill totally important it's and and it's one of those because you know i call it an elevator pitch it could be a personal value proposition or your value proposition or whatever right but um yeah i i like without that i it it's one of those things like I'll have a room full of, you know, senior executives and I'll be like, who has an elevator pitch? And it's funny because hardly anybody ever puts their hand up. And it's one of those skills that when you, when you have got it, you think, how did I get by without it? And now that I've got it, I can just keep evolving that and I'll use it for the rest of my career. And they, you end up having these sessions with people and then they're like, hold on, I, I use my elevator pitch, you know, several times a week now. And it's funny because they never even realised that they needed one in the first place. Yeah. And, and this is, you know, using that as an example, this is a sort of soft skill that a lot of us aren't working on and aren't developing. And it's pretty critical with what we're doing at the moment. Like you said, technology is just steaming ahead and you can't keep up with it all. But that, that people-centric, the human-centred focus is, is only becoming more important. So. Yeah. It's true, yeah. And and the the key thing in that is that if if your business and the people in your business have got an elevator pitch, they're already ahead of the rest, right? Because nobody else has them. So it's things like that that you start to think, oh, actually, there's value in my team understanding how to introduce, and you helping to shape that narrative is really important in terms of what how you want your business to be represented. Yeah. And and with that, I guess. A lot, we've got a fairly young um, core uh, employee base. They're all they're all a lot younger. In your experience, uh, are they have they been set up to succeed in this sort of consultative led world to be able to have these sort of conversations with clients, or are they needing? A lot more development of this of these soft skills that we're talking about. Look, I reckon some people are naturally going to be able to do that, but from my experience um, and working with the range of people that I work with, um, salespeople and consultants are really good at selling a product or service. But in Australia, typically we don't like to promote ourselves because if we're promoting ourselves and talking us, ourselves up, then we, you know, people think, oh, you know, you really up yourself or you're really, you know, conceited. Um, so we typically don't do that culturally here, um, and so and and across Asia, right? It's an Asia Pacific thing. So when you when you so yes, they know how to sell themselves from a from their product or service, but often they don't know how to position themselves in that without sounding well, trying to sound authentically, and that's what 
that's what this key thing here is, right? Being yeah. authentic. I'll put you on the spot now. What do, what does authentic really mean? Like a lot of people struggle with this in general. They hear that yeah. word and be genuine, but it, what does it's a bit of what a does buzzword, it mean? isn't it? Everyone it like is. just be authentic, be authentic. <laughs> uh, look, I think it's about understanding what you bring to the table that makes you uniquely you, right? And being able to state that. So I have a saying that I say a lot, right? Don't sell you, just tell you. And if you can articulate what what makes you special um, because you have got superpowers that other people don't have and that differentiate you from people that, that do what you do, right? And if you're able to articulate that for me and, and be truthful about it, then for me that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about being authentic. And that makes, that makes a lot of sense. I think a lot of people struggle uh, with self-awareness of what are their true strengths and, and sort of backing them. Is this – is this part of that soft skill development and career uh, development that you've been talking yeah. about? And I think that, it, like, you, you're raising a good point because a lot of us go through our, our career, right, and I kind of think, feel like our career is often like a river. So you think, you know, we jump in and some of us consciously jump in, right? We might study law or or accounting or whatever and we become an accountant or a lawyer right we 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 become a lawyer and then we go into a practice and we we continue up and we become a partner right that's a very conscious decision that we're making up front then there's others like the rest of us you know I studied a bachelor of arts and I think uh, I I I majored in toga parties like I had the time of my life but then went oh now I need to get a job what do I do and so I literally jumped into my career river with whoever would take me right and so then I get swept along and and for most of us then we do get swept along because there'll be a a new job will come up you know a a boss will go to a new company and we'll follow them and we just kind of get swept away so what was your original question because I did have a point to that it was it was off the back of the authenticity and the, most uh, people lacking self awareness. So is this part of the uh, that conversation for yeah. career development? So, so this is my long winded way of answering that. But I think that the idea is that we're not consciously making decisions, and so I think that that's um, yeah. My point's lost. I think because we were talking about yeah. I think my point's lost. <laughs> It's all right. It's, but anyway, it's, I'm sure it was going to be really good. <laughs> it's 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 the the self awareness piece. I think is critical. So the thing is that then it's about self discovery because we're going down. We get keep continue down the the career river, and then we have to go. Oh, actually, I haven't taken any time out to think. What am I good at? You know, what gives me energy? What do I enjoy actually doing? Because I might be good at stuff, but re- that might be a reputational strength right? It might be that other people think I'm good at that. But when you start to really think about what it is that you love doing and get energy from, that requires self dis- self-discovery. And, and having the time to do that then starts to link, what skills do I actually have? And so that's about being authentic. So that was my very long-winded way of getting to that point. <laughs> and I think that's where the owner managers come into uh, come into play of being able to help people have that conversation because obviously self-reflection is very difficult. It's very hard for you to just sit there and go, I'm super yeah. good at this, bang, 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 done. Like some people can do it, but the majority need the outside reflection. Well, because um, if it was like that, if it was if it was that easy, we'd be doing it all the time, right? Yeah, and we don't do it and we probably all avoid doing it, yeah, if we're really honest with ourselves. So, yes, that's why leaders are really important and that's why, you know, having coaching conversations and all of those things are important. One of this sort of leads into one of the soft skills that you are mentioning before, like interviewing skills. There's obviously two sides to this, being a, being the interviewee and being the interviewer. Okay. What What's some of the sort of tips that when you're um, training people on both sides that, they should focus on um, to be better at both sides. To be better at interviewing as a leader, like somebody that's simpler and also the candidate. Um, oh, gosh, there's lots of things. Um, I think the the recruitment or the interview process is very much geared towards um, the employer finding the right candidate and not letting the the candidate make sure that it's the right the right business. And I think if we could allow the process to, like, 
give space for the candidate to make sure they're making the right decision, you'd end up with a better workforce, right? Because then you'd know that they actually wanted to be in your business. It's not about you finding them, but they also have to make sure that you're right because then they're going to stay longer. They're going to be better employed. Like, you know, they're going to be set up for success, really. Um, so I think that's one of the things. Uh, I'm When I'm talking to candidates, I'm always like, make sure you ask lots of questions. You probably only have five minutes to do that. But if I was on the other side as a leader, I'd actually offer them more time than that. Like, okay, so I've asked my questions. What have you got for me? And let's make it a much more collaborative process because together then we can decide if that this is the right opportunity for both of us. It, That's the key, it, I reckon. And to me, from that, what you just said, that applies to a lot of our day-to-day jobs as well. Sometimes we're, we're being led by a client where we should be being the um, – being in control of the conversation internally and externally with different different third parties, that that whole process it doesn't just apply to the the, the recruitment side. It, it actually fits in all of our day to day lives. Yeah, and this is where we go back. See, we keep rounding back to the soft skills and you talk about that presentation and being able to present. That is a really critical skill that people in your organisation need to know how to do. And that doesn't even need to be just for people that are presenting information to clients. It could be that they need to present information to you, but they need to be able to, as the leader, right, but they need to be able to package that up so it's useful for you, but also it sets them up for success. So it, 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 soft skills just kind of, that it keeps coming around to that, right? It's really important to, to be developing those. What should be the expectations if I was, say, developing a, a younger person with these sort of soft skills? Is it something that happens overnight or, like, does it take years? Or what, what should be my expectations of a, of a person going through this sort of soft skills development? Oh, how long is a piece of string? Because <laughs> I feel like, like you know, at my age, still I'm learning soft skills, right? If if I give allow myself the opportunity to self reflect and then go, I go, what's next? There's always something, right? Um, some things are going to be picked up really easily, and some things are not. And some things are actually really hard to learn. So something like initiative for example, it's very hard to learn that. You kind of have that or not. There's things you can do to kind of teach somebody to be a little bit more proactive maybe, but, you know, some skills are going to be really hard and particularly hard for some people depending on the level of where they're at in the spectrum in terms of that skill. But then some things are going to be like presentation skills, for example, you could go in and and teach that and then they could apply that immediately. And and that's one of the things that I'm very passionate about is like have immediate application, like things that they can take practical tools and tips so that you can actually start to put them into place because high level, uh, like this is kind of what this means and so you have to kind of use it in your job. It's not going to be really helpful for people. They need to have practical ways of being able to actually implement it. Yeah. It's a hard <laughs> question to answer because it depends really. And, and like what you said, it's a cyclical year as well. It's not just a, it's not linear where you just chip off each certification and you're done. It's, it's this reflection um, process of learning it, doing it, reflecting, improving, and, and so on. Totally. But, it's funny because I do, I do, a, I have a, um, uh, a question a questionnaire that is for emotional intelligence for managers or around different you know sort of areas of that and you know sometimes they'll go you know I, I, I'm nailing this like I've got such high emotional intelligence and all the components and then other times they'll like they might do the test again or the quiz again you know in in a few months later even and then be like oh yeah actually I had a bad experience with that one so you're constantly assessing and changing and you know evolving and depending on what's going on for you at that time and how far stretched you are, you know, like things change. And I think that's when when everyone hears that sort of growth mindset, like this is what that actually means, isn't it? It's not, it's not that career ladder. It's this constant reflection and cycle of improving yourself. Oh, I love the growth mindset. I love it. And um, I don't know if you've delved into it very much, but um, Carol Dweck is like the – 
legend in this space and she has done some TED Talks and stuff. They're really worth um, having a look at. Um, but one was Is the Power of Yet. You know, have you heard of that one? Yeah, I love it. So it's so powerful because what she's saying is they uh, there was a study done in the US with high school students and people that did maths, instead of getting a failure rate, they got a not yet. So it's not that you have failed that subject, you just haven't got it yet. And I love that because then it opens you up, like you can see that growth mindset because, um, yeah, you, you don't know maths yet, but you will. there's still the opportunity to, to be able to learn that. It hasn't closed it off, like not fail, that's it, you're really bad at maths. Um, and I use that a lot, you know, in the sessions that I will do because it's like that simple three-letter word yet just changes the way people can, can um, view themselves and also situations. It's amazing. I don't know that yet. I love it. it. It's that's a that's a very good, very great concept because I think a lot of um, a lot of owners and managers they they're trying to manage the business day to day. The failures uh, are trying to be managed, so there's the, there's less opportunity for reputational harm on, on the business. Um, and we're probably from the traditional way of learning: you either pass or you fail type of thing. But that's not actually life. What you said it's yet yeah, it's. Um, the the amount of people that I come across with limiting beliefs um, is crazy. It's it's why a lot of our businesses aren't succeeding because even the owners put limiting beliefs on themselves. Uh, it sounds a bit wanky, but it, it's it's the yeah. case when you've got that abundance mentality, you've got that growth mentality. Things come a lot easier. Yeah, I love it. I I actually um, first heard about it. I so when my son was like in junior junior school right and this this one pager came up with fixed mindset and growth mindset I was like oh this sounds really interesting and so I actually stuck it on my wall I was like I I started to really get into it because I love that the kids are learning this from an early age now like you know not like when we were at school and you you pass and look they're still pass fails but there's it, it it's just changing the way that we're viewing things and I think as adults we can learn a lot from that yeah I love it and I think too, what you were mentioning, like uh, the kids are learning it; they're the ones coming up into the workforce. So if we don't have, if we don't embrace that mentality and know how know how to leverage it, we're gonna have a lot of trouble. Because if we have that sort of binary pass fail and all all that sort of mindset, it's yep. gonna put off the people wanting to join us or staying with us. So that open mindedness helps a lot with having those sort of conversations. Yeah. And and look, you know, we can link that back to innovation as well because so I I kind of, I like to think of, you know, growth mindset, I love it, and um, but also psychological safety. So creating an environment where if you're telling people and they're saying, oh, I failed that or or, I haven't got that yet, you haven't got it yet, you haven't learnt that yet, it kind of kind of lends itself into being a little bit more psychologically safe. And I think then that's where, you know, if you're in a trusted environment and you're creating a trusted team environment then you're going to get innovation and creativity and um, risk taking and risk taking can be as simple as somebody putting up their hand with an idea that they may think might be a bit stupid and if they're not in a psychologically safe environment they're not gonna it's not gonna get aired and it could be the one thing that just kind of takes off right and that would have been a lost opportunity yeah yeah so it's very fascinating uh, this conversation, and one of the things when I saw you present ages ago that, uh, that really triggered me, and I saw the audience cringe when you said it, um, was the whole developing the skills to um, build out LinkedIn and, and their their resume and things like that. Like, wh- why why is that a soft skill that you'd want to develop of your employees? Oh, so like. Um, LinkedIn particularly is such a powerful school, um, tool, right? Like, I don't know business people that aren't on LinkedIn. So we're all there. That's a, it's a captive audience. And I think like the thing is then people say, oh, no, I don't want to do LinkedIn training because if I do LinkedIn training, then people are going to leave my organization or other people will find them right? We've already ascertained that 59% of people, you know, are potentially planning on leaving your business anyway. But that aside, the thing is that LinkedIn allows you as an organization also to really like lift your, um, lift your, your brand through the people that work there. 
it's uh, it's such an exciting tool as a as a proactive way of just having your brand out there and elevating that. I think it's great. Uh, I do too. I'm a bit biased because I live on it. I live but on I, it too. <laughs> but I think that um, it's that fear of losing um, the people, isn't it? And as as we're talking through this, it's really reinforcing that. Well, by not doing these kinds of things, we're actually creating more static people. That's why they are looking. Uh, yeah. That's why they do start to look outwards. Yeah. There was a study done, and I'd have to check. I'm not sure if it was LinkedIn or C-Suite that did this one, um, C-Suite data, but they were saying that 75% of people were likely to stay if they had understood their internal movements, like what was available to them. But 56% um, said that they had not had that opportunity. So, like, yeah, look, career conversations are just so important, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, as we start to start to wrap up, that whole point of um, it's not a career ladder, like this is where a lot of the small businesses get stuck of going, like you said, yeah. Uh, we don't actually have the positions and roles, but it, it doesn't matter. We actually have the advantage in a small business to give people more opportunities and responsibilities and trying different things and, and yeah. a big corporate, right? So let me tell you some other stats. I've got some stats here actually. Um, the the thing is, and this is around employees not feeling like they get enough the right support. So 26%, um, this was definitely a C-suite data um, uh, study. They said 26% say that or employers say that their organisation challenged them to learn a new skill, only 26%. 15% said that their organisation encouraged them to move to a new role and only 14% of those organisations encouraged their people to develop to, to build a new development, a career development plan. So that that, that is t- alarming to me, really small, right? That is like employees not getting enough support. So it's no wonder so many people are wanting to leave businesses. Yeah. Yeah, and it, does, it doesn't shock me from experience. And I think, too, if we take in the demographics like we've been talking about as well, the millennials and the Gen Zs as an example, we're all used to more flexibility as well. So that traditional need for a career ladder actually isn't there. Um, it is that conversation and, and that, that growth and, I guess, before I start to ask you to wrap up, I've got a fo- another question for you is what are we sort of expecting from our people? Are they going to stay with us forever or what's what's more reality? What If I was a business owner, what should I sort of typically be expecting if I've got a good engaged employee that I'm growing? How long should I sort of expect them? I don't know the numbers, but I just think if you've got an employee that is engaged and is excited to come for, to work, then that is the best situation, right? Because that's where you're going to have creativity and it, like all those amazing things that are going to happen in your business. And you want to package that up as long or bottle it as long as you can, right? But you need to, you need, and there's some people that you don't want to stay in your business and that's okay but the ones that you do it's around this like to retain them you've got to offer them like development and you've got to offer them you know opportunities and um you know and look opportunities can be really basic stuff like if somebody wants to learn how to present better then maybe let them take the team meetings right that's presenting but that little thing that actually then gives you time as a leader to do something else allows them the opportunity to do what they really need and what what's important to them remember bite size so i think you need to be developing your people yeah well, this has been it's been chock full of of different things that I may not have considered in the past. What what do you want people to really take away from today? If there's one or two major lessons that you really want to reiterate, and then people aren't doing this already, what do they need to do to get started? Yeah, so I think the thing is that we are living in like innovation is the lifeblood really of any organization and technology is really driving that, right? So, um, but at the end of the day, the robots can't do everything. 
So we need to be developing our people and um, to be able to innovate and we want our people to feel safe and looked after and really nurtured. Um, And so to do that, it's around thinking about what, what career opportunities they might have and like we were talking about it's a rock climbing rule it doesn't have to be up because you might be the next step for them that's not going to be necessarily a viable thing so I'd be thinking about what other things can they get involved in yeah I think that's the key stuff for me and to me I think uh, just the thing that's resonated with me the most is if, if you're not developing these people they're going to leave and you're going to be left with the ones that don't have these skills and aren't willing to develop these skills either. So you're in a worse off position than actually taking the time to, yeah. to give this a go. Because you're left with the people that you didn't want to keep. And I, I think there's a lot of people that are listening that are probably uh, are in that position in our industry. We've had a lot of changes from COVID and the salary increases and uh, as a dynamic shift of what we're doing. We're, we're not left with the people that are wanting to or possible that could take us into the future. We're left with the people from from yesterday. Um, and that's yeah. a very dangerous position to be in. Totally. And, and, and you know, we've talked about some soft skills. You know, we talked about presentation skills and, and communication in terms of introduction skills and that. But there's a whole lot of different stuff. And that doesn't necessarily – look, I'm a small business owner and I know, you know, the money can't go everywhere, like, and there's only mm-hmm. so much of it. But, you know, it doesn't have to cost a whole lot of money to be able to do – to offer these things. And sometimes it can be just done in-house. It's just actually you having the conversations and asking the right questions. I think that's I think that's some awesome wisdom to finish mm-hmm. up on. So, hopefully, everyone that's been listening along today has taken taken as much away as, from the conversation as I have. And it's been, this has been great to have you, Catherine. So, I really appreciate your time. For having me. No worries. Well, until next time.